Yeah, would you yield uh, for a question sure. to the chair? Of course. Senator you know, how many people were killed in that? 18? 13 people were 13 killed were on the killed. bridge that day. Are you aware that about the same time that happened in my state of Oklahoma, and of course this is back when we were in the process of the last long-term uh, bill in 2005, that a mother and uh, three children were driving below a bridge in Oklahoma City, concrete dropped off, it killed the mother. Now we corrected that in the 2005 bill. But the question I'd ask you is, why do we wait until people die before this happens? We right now, and I've got a list, and after a little while today, I'm gonna to repeat it for the third time, about the bridges in, in this country, that we can avoid that happening. And if we don't do something, and you're not gonna do it, you can't do any of the large projects on short-term extensions. So I guess my only question is, why do we wait until death is at our door? Well, I appreciate that question from the Senator from Oklahoma, and thank you for your work on this bill and your chairmanship of this committee and your willingness to work across the aisle on this bill. And I will say that that is the major problem here. When we just do the short-term extensions, maybe one little new project gets funded here and there, but you don't do that long-term maintenance, which is never as glamorous as building new projects. This is about the long-term maintenance and work that needs to be done on our existing roads and bridges, as well as some exceptions new opportunities, but when we don't have that kind of clear funding source for our states to see that has a three-year window, as the presiding officer knows from her leadership in the state of Nebraska, you just can't do things in a state when you don't know what your funding is going to be three months later. You're not able to invest in the kind of maintenance and long-term work that needs to be done, and that is why I thank uh, the chairman and the ranking member, uh, Senator Boxer, for her incredible work on this bill as well as yours, because this is about a long-term arc, planning not just for safety, but also for our economy. Would the senator yield for another question? Yes. I want to thank my friend because you have been such a leader, and I was listening to every word you said, as I did when Senator Inhofe talks about the mother that was killed because a bridge collapsed. This, is, this touches our hearts as family members, yes, as senators, but as family members, we know those families will never be the same. The family, the children of that mother, the families of those who are grieving the loss of their uh, relatives. And so I want to say to my friend, who is just so early on a supporter, is she aware that seven states already have either canceled pro uh, projects or completely shut down uh, their, uh, their highway and transit spending? Is she aware of that? I uh, guess I am. And I wanted to say uh, that I have a chart here that shows the, the states that have either canceled or delayed highway projects. These projects are valued at over $1.6 billion. And think about the jobs and the businesses that are suffering. They are in Arkansas, Delaware, Georgia, Montana, Tennessee, Utah, and Wyoming. And I have a further question. I know my friend has heard me uh, say this. Is my friend aware that the Associated General Contractors of America came out with a new study, and they just were in the New York Times stating that because of our, I will use this word, dithering, because we haven't come up with that long-term bill that we are now attempting to do, 25 states have lost construction jobs just in the last month. Is my friend aware of this study? Uh, yes, I have heard that of the study, and I think it mimics what we've seen in other studies, that uh, when you don't plan ahead, people are just going to start cutting the work off. Right, and I would just say before I would uh, yield that the states that lost construction jobs last month, according to the general contractors, are Alaska, Arizona, California, Florida, Georgia, Illinois, Maryland, Mississippi, Missouri, Montana, Nebraska, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New Mexico, North Carolina, Ohio, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Tennessee, Utah, Vermont, Washington, West Virginia, and Wisconsin. I wanted to read those off, and I will talk about that later, 
but I just want to thank my friend because the points, when she talked about what happened on this bridge, my friend didn't have to read one word of any statement. This was a heartbreaking memory she will always have. And it's, we all go through this in our time here when there's earthquakes, flood, fires, bridge collapses. And I would just say to my friend, this last question is, don't you think this is important enough that the house stay an extra week if need be, or even a few days to take up our bill, pass it, or if they don't like it, to amend it, send it back, and let's get this done for the American people. Well, uh, Senator Boxer and also Senator Inhofe, I think that is why we're here today, to talk about the fact that we have come together across party lines with people of completely different political ideologies to agree that we need a long-term fix to our transportation problem. And as you mentioned the people, I think sometimes people think of transportation as just bricks and mortar and something yeah, very esoteric, um, uh, but it's not. It's about the people that use the system. And as Senator Inhofe talked about uh, the people that died when that bridge collapsed in his state, there is a memorial for those 13 people that died in our state. And I would suggest if you ever come to the Twin Cities, people go look at it because you know what it shows you, just like Senator Inhofe knows from what happened in Oklahoma. It shows you that everyone uses the roads and bridges. These people came from vastly different backgrounds. Uh, they were young people. Uh, there was a man who died uh, who he and his wife had just decided they wanted to have a baby. And of all things, after he died, she then decided to adopt children uh, by herself. And then she decided to adopt them from Haiti. And then the tragedy happened in Haiti and we actually helped her to get those children home. These were people who worked all kinds of different jobs. Some were coming home from work, some were students, uh, some were people, moms busy in a car. Those are the people that died. They were America, and America uses our bridges and, roads, bridges and our roads and our trains, and we have to remember that this is about the people that work construction, this is about the people that use the roads and bridges, and this is really about our economy moving forward. Um, and so sometimes we get so into facts and figures here and what one house does and what the other house does that we forget why we are spending money on our bridges and our roads and what this means for our future economy. So I just want to thank um, the leaders of this bill for what they have done, their willingness uh, to take a lot of heat uh, for working across the aisle to make sure that the things that were used to pay for this bill were things that made sense for our country and continued to allow us to move forward. And then also to make changes to the bill when uh, members have raised problems. And that's why there is, gain, there is gaining so much momentum. And I'm sure our friends over in the House are looking at this bill. They've examined the pay fors They've had uh, now weeks to do that. And that they've also looked at the safety provisions and other things in the bill. So at some point, uh, they're going to have the ability to decide if they're for this bill or against it, or as Senator Boxer mentioned, if they want to make some changes. But the key is here, we have a good base bill that have been brought people together from across the country, from different ideologies that they can use and look at, because if they just want to do another one of these short-term fixes, it is never going to get us to where we need to go, so we don't need, so we don't have another one of these bridge collapse on August 1st in the middle of a summer day. That happened in this country, in this century, and it will happen again if we keep this up. Thank you, and I yield the floor. The senator from California. Just because I know my friend from Oklahoma wants to speak, is it okay if I go about 10 minutes and then yield? Before the senator leaves the floor, I want to thank her again. And what I want to say to her is something that she has said to me over and over. And that is the importance of finding common ground when we can. We all know we can't give up our principles, but we have to search for common ground. And what we did here, and everyone knows, and Senator Enough and I kind of joke about it, we couldn't be different in terms of our ideology. We really couldn't. But on this one, on this piece, the need to have a strong infrastructure, we are as one, as progressives, as conservatives. And frankly, everyone, I think, in this Senate should come together and in the House around the principle that you can't have a strong economy if you can't move goods. That's why my friend Senator Inhofe put together a great new freight title in our bill this time. 
part of the formula. It's hugely important. We can't move goods. We can't move people. We're going to fall behind. And clearly, when bridges collapse, it is a devastation. Uh, I have shown this particular bridge collapse along with the one Senator Klobuchar was so eloquent on. This is a bridge in my great state. We have 40 million people. We take in about 40 to 50 percent of all the imports into our nation. And they go into trucks and trains and planes, and they use our roads, and they go across the country to deliver goods to everyone. Well, the bridge that collapsed in California a few days ago, maybe a week or two ago now, was deemed to be obsolete because it was built for very light traffic. It's the bridge between California and Arizona. There was very little traffic at the time it was built, and now we have a huge amount of traffic, and this bridge collapsed. Thank the Lord no one died. So I can stand up here and say that. This, to me, is the poster child of the work, Madam President, we are doing together. This is the poster child. There is a list of bridges. There are you're, more than 60,000 bridges are deficient. 60,000 bridges in America. This is America. They're deficient. Some worse than others, but they're deficient. I've listed just a few here, just a few. Alabama, Arizona, Arkansas, California, Colorado, Connecticut, District of Columbia, Florida, Georgia, Hawaii, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kentucky, Louisiana, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, Minnesota, Mississippi, Missouri, Nevada, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, North Carolina, Ohio, Oklahoma, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, South Carolina, Texas, Utah, Washington, Wisconsin. This is just a handful, a couple of handfuls of the 60,000 plus bridges that are deficient. Senator Inhofe, in your state, we've listed as an example the I-40 bridge over Crooked Oak Creek. And, you know, I was saying yesterday, when I was a county supervisor a really, really long time ago, we found out as supervisors, and we were a very bipartisan group, that our civic center was at risk of collapsing in an earthquake. And in those years, you didn't know that much about how to reinforce it. It was just coming to light, and it was a Frank Lloyd Wright, it is a Frank Lloyd Wright building, a gorgeous building, a historic building. And we were told, if we didn't fix it, if we didn't fix it, there was a possibility we could be held personally liable if something happened. Now, clearly, no one here is going to be personally held liable if a bridge collapses. But morally, we need to understand that now that we know that we have 60,000 plus bridges in bad condition, and we have 50% of our roads not up to par, we have an obligation to fix it. And it is very clear that we must do so. Now, I am proud that almost half of the Democratic caucus has come together with a larger percent of the Republican caucus to put together a transportation bill. I am proud of that. And it is on the road to passage, Madam President. Last night, at a crucial moment, late in the evening, we got 62 votes. That was not an easy thing to do. Because as you know, Madam President, there were more things you wanted in that bill. There were more things I wanted. You, I wanted things out of the bill, other things added. Each one of us, of course, we're people who are passionate about these issues, we would have written the bill differently. I would say anyone in America having the chance would write it differently. But the art of compromise is something we shouldn't be afraid of. You're not compromising your principles. You're seeing where you can find the sweet spot. And I believe that we did this. 
and I am urging the House not to leave on their summer break and to stay and to work on this bill. We've done a lot of the heavy lifting. We've done a lot of the heavy compromising. They can do more. They can take out things they don't like, add things they want. We can sit down in a conference. We can get this done. My opinion, they should take it and pass it. When a bill has 62 votes here, that's pretty darn good. If they want to tweak it, they can do it. But I think they need to stay, Madam President. I served proudly with my friend, Senator Inhofe, in the House. I served for 10 years. It's been 10 years since the House has had this long of a break. They haven't left before August for the August recess. And I think they should stay. They should stay. You know, the average American, when they're about to go on their summer break, the boss says, clean up your desk, please. Finish, finish your work, please. Don't just pile everything on one side of the table, please. Take care of it. The House ought to finish its work. Take up our bill, amend it, send it back, we'll get it done. Most of the work is done. Most Americans have to tie up loose ends before they take a long break. I might add, I think it's a five-week break. A five-week break. Do your work. Maybe you can only go on a four-week break. That would still be twice the time most Americans get. Do your work. You know, when I say that bridges are in poor condition, this isn't hyperbole. This is fact. This isn't some study put out by a Democrat or a Republican. It's put out by the engineers. Our infrastructure is rated, I believe it's a D overall. A D? If our child came home and said, Mom, I have a D, you wouldn't be happy. Well, taxpayers are unhappy that our infrastructure is rated a D. So I ask the House, please stay and do your job. Roll up your sleeves. We'll work with you. We can resolve these things. You've had time to look at our bill. And I'll close with just two more points, Madam President. I want to give the highlights of our transportation bill that we work so hard on across party lines. Senator Inhofe, myself, the Banking Committee, Chairman and Ranking, the Commerce Committee, Chairman and Ranking, the Finance Committee that paid for this bill. And some people are voting against it because they don't like the way it's paid for. They say it's better to find some long-term answer in international tax reform. Personally, I think that's a great idea. But you have time to pay for the last three years in that fashion. We've paid for three years. This bill is six years. Pay for the last three years. As for me, I'm a lonely voice here. There's about five of us who say a penny a month <coughs> for 10 months on the gas tax. We don't have the votes. So what do I do? Go in my corner and cry? I don't have the vote? No, we've got to put a bill together. So this is a $50 billion a year bill for six years. Three years are paid for. <coughs> Every state gets more formula funding for both highways and transit. There are two new programs, a formula freight program, my friend Senator Inhofe, working with Republicans and Democrats put together a new grant program for major projects called the AMP program. Senator Whitehouse worked across the aisle for that program. All of our states are eligible. It includes the McCaskill bill, and it's, it's the McCaskill-Schumer bill that says that rental car companies cannot, cannot lease out cars that are under recall. And, and, and I think this is important, because we see a lot of the problems with the Takata airbags because of Senator Nelson's work so hard on that. We have tripled NHTSA fines, and we've used that money in the bill to help put positive train control on the commuter rails. This is important. People are dying because we don't have positive train control. Is the bill the perfect bill on safety? In my view, it is not. In somebody else's view, it is. 
It's a compromise, but I think overall it's solid. Every state, every state will see an increase in their highway dollars, in their transit dollars. So in closing, I want to thank senators on both sides of the aisle, including uh, Madam President, you, because we did work together, and we did a good job, and it was hard to do. I know my friend uh, had one provision she wanted. She had to scale it back. It's hard to do that. I had a program that I wanted. It got scaled back. We all had to give and take. But that's what the people expect of us. Whether they're Democrats, Republicans, independents, doesn't matter. They want us to get something done. I'm proud of the Senate. We're not done yet. We still need some more votes on this, so everyone stay tuned. But if the House will stay an extra few days, take up our bill, we can get this done for the American people. We can save businesses. We can save jobs. We can keep this recovery going, and we can feel proud that we fixed our bridges, that we fixed our highways, and that we did the work that we're supposed to do. And with that, I would yield the floor. Madam President. The, the senator from Oklahoma. Well, I'm going to um, have to disagree with uh, my partner over here on one thing, and that is uh, the insistence that the, the House stay. There's a way, they're not going to, in my opinion, they're not going to stay. That's done. But this can still be done with their uh, targeted adjournment date for them. And the way that can happen is for us, to, right now, we're waiting out the vote. It happened, if nobody yields back, it's on my, it's on, it's on the Inhofe substitute. That's what we're doing right now. And that vote would take place at five o'clock in the morning. Now, if you move that up, and right now we're asking you to take unanimous consent to do that. If we're able to do that, that could happen this afternoon. And that means that we could have the next step would be to move to the bill. And that could be done while they're still here. And what I don't want to happen is, is to have them, you know, we, we are successful. We get done with our bill and then send it over to the House and they're gone. And so I think we can still do it while the House is still here. And I, and I have to say, and I'm not sure that my, um, the ranking member of my committee, Senator Boxer, uh, agrees with this, but I think that they never believed we'd be able to get the bill done. And, uh, and that being the case, they staked out early and said that they, you know, they're, for any number of reasons, they're gonna be gone. Well, we can do it. All we have to do is to move this up and to get the yield back on the time. We do the same thing then on final passage. And we could have the bill over there in good enough time, Wednesday, that's tomorrow, that they could still act on the bill. That would be my, uh, my goal on this, because I think that's the only way that we're going to... Would the senator yield for I would question? Have to yield. I would love to get this thing done in five minutes, so let me be clear about where mm -hmm. I stand. But have, has my friend received confirmation from Speaker Boehner that he would take up the bill tomorrow. My understanding is the reason they've moved up there, and this is not, this is what I've heard. I, I can't swear to it. I don't know if it's accurate, but what I've heard is they're actually moving their adjournment up from Thursday to Wednesday so they can escape having to take up our bill. Does my friend believe if we get this bill done tomorrow that they would stay in 24 hours and deal with our bill? Well, reclaim my time. I, I don't know what they would do. I would just say that if we don't finish it until they're already gone, then we know what happens. And, um, but but I, I still think that can be done. And uh, the, there is a sense of urgency. We've worked long and hard. You know, people are saying that they haven't had time to get into this thing. We passed our bill. You know, they've had five or six weeks uh, to, to absorb this. And this argument on you have a six-year uh, bill with only three years of funding, there's, it's kind of a phony argument because we have a valve that isn't, it doesn't exist anywhere else, that if we go through, start a six-year bill, that would allow us to get into the major projects that the senator from Minnesota was talking about and that you've been talking about and I've been talking about that you can't get into with short-term extensions. We all understand that. So we could start those projects. 
Given three years, I can assure you that we would have the opportunity to find offsets that would be acceptable. We we're operating under the gun before, that would take that away. We can go ahead and accept the fact that we have three years funded, and then for those individuals, and I'm speaking now of my colleagues on this side of the aisle who are conservative, who have had the argument that we're not gonna be, we're, we will then have to borrow money uh, in order to finish the six years. The six years stop. There's a, a safety valve there that will cause the six years, the, the, the funding to stop exactly when that time comes that we run out of the money in the trust fund. So we can really have it both ways. We can start the projects, and then we'll be enough pressure on, and we'll be able to do. And incidentally, I have to say this because I have to keep reminding my friends, there is a conservative position, and that's to pass this bill. Uh, you know, I get so tired of people who, uh, there are a lot of people out there who actually voted for the $800 billion uh, way back in the beginning of the Obama administration, the $800 billion stimulus bill that didn't stimulate. Uh, we tried to put an amendment on there. I know the senator from California and I co-sponsored amendments. They were all rejected. Then along came the $700 billion bailout. A lot of my re Republican friends voted for that. Now they complain that the money isn't there. Well, the money can be there. If it hadn't been for those two things, we wouldn't be talk having this conversation today. But the money can be there. We need time to let that happen. Certainly as we start the major, pass this bill, start the major projects that are going on, then we'll be in a position to do that. The key to make that happen, to allow that to happen, I'm not gonna give up because you know, the House hasn't left yet. They say they're gonna leave tomorrow afternoon. Well, if we go ahead and yield back enough time to get this vote, uh, this afternoon, we could do the same thing on the final uh, vote. And by the way, those individuals who want to have amendments, you can still have germane amendments that would not be treated as an amendment, but we could consider putting those into the manager's amendment. Now, if that happens, that would become a part of the vote that they would be voting on tomorrow. So to allow that to happen, we have to go ahead, yield back time so that we can have this uh, this vote taking place and start working on those amendments that are germane to see which of those we're going to be in a position to to uh, to consider. So anyway, that's that's what I'm hoping will happen. That's what I, I think uh, there's an opportunity. Again, people who make statements, and I know that I, I have a lot of friends in the House. I spent eight years in the House, and these individuals that are speaking now, one of them had made that it's kind of an off-the-cuff statement about uh, about, uh, you know, we're just not going to consider it. Well, I really believe that most of them over there felt that we weren't going to be successful in passing a bill. And so it's still possible we can do that. We do have the time left. We know what we have to do uh, to do that. Is that the freight? Yeah. Do you have some stuff yeah. on that? Yeah. Let me um, just talk a little bit about some of the things that the sense of urgency. First of all, I appreciate the fact that this conversation took place. The senator from Minnesota, she has some pretty graphic pictures there of what happened that took the lives of 13 people, uh, a bridge falling down. It just, it's, but today, the national highway system carries more than 55% of the nation's highway traffic and 97%, 97% of the truck freight traffic. Now, we've never had a freight uh, provision in these. This is my sixth uh, bill that I've worked on and actually going all the way back to the House days. But we've never had a freight provision to take care of this problem. Of the four million miles of public road, the National Highway System represents five and a half percent of the nation's most heavily traveled miles of road. Americans depend on a well-maintained national highway system and, and that provides critical connections between urban and rural communities. The American businesses pay an estimated $27 billion a year in, uh, in uh, extra freight transportation costs due to the poor condition of the public roads. Look at it, look at that. How many lanes are there on this one? There's six lanes, all of them stopped. Now what's happened when they stop? The engines keep going, the air is polluted, gasoline costs a lot of money, and the freight can't go through. Well, that's why we have this. Now recognizing that it's a foundation of the nation's economy and the key to the nation's ability to compete in the global economy, it's essential that we uh, focus efforts to improve freight movement 
on the national highway system. Now, incidentally, if we don't pass this bill and if we go back to extensions, that ain't going to happen. Just not going to, it can't happen. And uh, it, it, I always have to pause to remind my conservative friends, and I can say this because I've had the ranking of the most conservative member probably more than anybody else has, that the Constitution tells us what we're supposed to be doing here. We're doing things, a lot of things that the Constitution never contemplated. But it says in Article 1, Section 8, we in the House and the Senate are supposed to be defending America and roads and bridges and highways. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And so I just say, you know, I have to remind people the conservative position, the constitutional uh, that is to go ahead and do what we're trying to do with the Drive Act today. The Drive Act includes two new programs to help the states deliver projects and to promote the, the safety of uh, the uh, movement of these. The first new program is the National Freight Program. That's what we're talking about right now. That's what's bogged down in the traffic right now. It's distributed by a formula that will provide funds to all states to enhance the movement of goods, reduce costs, and improve the performances of, of businesses. The program will expand flexibility for both rural and urban areas. And now the reason, that, a lot of the reason that this hasn't been handled before is that states send in their priorities. You know, one of the few things in government that does work is that what we're going through right now. When we set up a formula, we take into consideration what do the people at home want? What do the people in my state of Oklahoma think is the most important thing in terms of roads and bridges and highways and, and maintenance in the state of Oklahoma? Now, there's some liberals here in, in Washington who think that there's never been a good dis decision unless it comes out of Washington. But this, we always emphasize what they consider to be the greatest concern within their states. Now, the reason that freight doesn't often get the high priorities that it should is because a lot of the freight moves in and out of a state, and the states don't evaluate that as the, the economic, as the benefit when in fact that's short-sighted short -sighted because states on either side provide that kind of a traffic that does add to the economy of the state. It's just not direct like the rest of the uh, projects are. So we have this type of congestion taking place. Secondly, it'll, it'll improve efforts to identify projects with a high return on investment through state freight plan, plans and state advisory uh, committees. The second new program is the Assistance for Major Projects Program, which creates a competitive grant program to provide funds for major projects of high importance to a community, a region, or to the nation. And the uh, program includes a set aside for rural areas and assures an equitable geographic distribution of the funds. To me, state of Oklahoma, it's a rural state. That's a very important thing. So anyway, we have that program. And again, these are major projects. One thing you can't do with the short-term extensions, and keep in mind the last time we had a long-term bill, a reauthorization bill was 2005, and at, by the time, the time that 2009 got here, we were working on just the short-term uh, uh, extension, 33 short-term extensions. So you can't do those major projects that have to be done sooner or later in, uh, in, in, our, in our country. So we have, an, uh, do you have charts on these? Chicago. Yeah, we have the Chicago, Illinois, the I-2290 uh, and the I-90 uh, and, and 94 intersections. We have, is that what that chart is? That's the intersection, that's the one we've been looking at with the congestion that is up there. It's the number one worst freight bottleneck in the United States. The average speed slows down to 29 uh, miles, an, uh, miles an hour. Morning and e evening rush hour speeds have been known to drop below 20 miles an hour. It carries about 300,000 vehicles a day. That's the Chicago I-29. Houston, Texas. Uh, the I-45 at the U.S. and the, certainly the occupier of the chair is fully aware and has, I'm sure has been bogged down in traffic many times on the uh, Texas I-45 at U.S. 59 exchange. Houston, Texas is the home of five of the top 20 freight bottlenecks in the nation. Texas is home of nine of the top 25 uh, freight bottlenecks. Freight bottlenecks cost 
freight uh, industry in Texas, $671 million annually and 8.8 .8 million hours of delay. And here's where we're looking at, looking at Houston. And I happens that I was stopped there going through there one time. That's why I always fly down to South Texas instead of drive to avoid that. So uh, the I-45 at the intersection is ranked the third by congestion index, the third in the nation. Uh, it is uh, the same I-45 at the 610 north is ranked 15. So uh, the average speed slow down to 39 miles an hour, and there they are out there uh, wasting valuable time. Um, Fort Lee, New Jersey. The I-95 at uh, that you're looking at right now connects Fort Lee, New, New Jersey to New York City. It's the second worst freight bottleneck in, uh, uh, by congestion index in the nation. Average speeds slow to 29, 29 miles an hour. Rush hour speeds in the morning and evening slow down to about 15 miles an hour. The nearby I-95 uh, Cross Bronx Expressway is the most congested corridor in the country. By the way, that's one that anyone from here in Washington going up to any place along the coast, Connecticut on up north, they have to go through that. And I've had to do that. I had occasion just the other day to give a uh, kind of a commencement talk up at the, the um, Coast Guard Academy. To get up there, I had to go all the way across that bridge to get up there. That was, it almost made me late to get up at that thing. So, that is, that's one that is well known. The George Washington Bridge is the, the world's busiest uh, motor vehicle bridge carrying over 106 million cars um, a year. So anyway, that's, uh, that's what we have right now. We have a freight program and you, we have another talk that we've given several times where we go over all the bridges. The Senator from Minnesota was talking about the tragedy of, of the bridges. But if you look and you see, it's not just confined to the East Coast. If you look and you see uh, the, in my state of Oklahoma, in the northeastern section, uh, we have more bridges, deficient bridges, than uh, probably right number three in, in the nation, I would say. And those bridges are not gonna be addressed until we have a chance to do it. So we have uh, the opportunity to look at that. And uh, yeah, put, put Eisenhower up there. It's right there. I always like this because and going back and looking at, I think a lot of the people in, in this, in addition to my cons, uh, chairmanship of the Environment and Public Works Committee, I've been ranking member of the Senate Armed Services Committee. I think it's deplorable what this President Obama has done to our military. I call it the disarming of America. And yet the guy who started this whole thing, I don't, I don't think even the chair is aware of the fact that the reason that Eisenhower started this national thing way back in 1956 was for defense, to defend our nation. He said, as it is right now, we don't have any type of a system where you can take goods and services and move them across to the either coast to be sent out uh, in the defense of this country. And his actual quote, uh, which I can't read from here, but uh, he talked about his major reason for starting this system was for defending America. So uh, I'm hoping, anyway, this is, this is what can happen. Right now, we are in the middle of a, not doing anything, not getting anything done, but it's a 30 hour delay. If we just move that up so that instead of voting on that at five o'clock in the morning, that we could vote on it uh, uh, this afternoon, which would be just as easy to do, and, and I would, I'm, I'm gonna be asking unanimous consent that we're able to do that, then we could move on and do the same thing as we move toward the bill. Now, if that happens, those individuals, and I would hope that the staff is listening to this, those who have germane amendments, they, we, we can't take up amendments after the passage. This is gonna pass, we know it's gonna pass, but is it gonna pass this afternoon or is it gonna pass uh, uh, tomorrow morning and then we wouldn't be in a position to do anything till the House already adjourned. Now, if this happens, if they'll bring amendments down, we'll consider germane amendments, and we still have the manager's amendment that we'll be able to uh, put these in, and we will consider these. Uh, so there's an opportunity for that to take place, and I wouldn't want anyone voting to uh, deny this opportunity to finish this bill and, and let the House either at least look at it, thinking that they wouldn't be able to get their amendments in. We've had an opportunity to have amendments in for a long time. I like to I always hasten to say this because 
how long has it been now? Six, it's been six weeks since we passed this out of the uh, uh, VAR committee, and it passed unanimously. Every Democrat and every Republican, and I have to say that the Republicans and that are my committee that I chair are among the most conservative Republicans, and the Democrats are among the most liberal Democrats. That's a holdover from when the Democrats had control of the, of the, uh, of the Senate, and so the en Environment and Public Works Committee was chaired by my colleague, uh, who refers to herself as a very proud progressive, that means liberal, and uh, I'm a very proud conservative, so we all have this in common. But just to have the opportunity to, to have this uh, up so that we can consider it, we would have to move this up and get this vote to take place tonight. And so I hope, I'm hoping that will still be the case. Uh, we've, we're making our case on that, and uh, again, that would allow us to get this done in a way, or at least to let the House look at this and see whether or not that, that is an option they may want to pursue. I know several have painted themselves into the corner, but nonetheless, we could do this if we could hurry this up. I know there are other uh, speakers on the floor, so I would yield the floor.